Gonsalvo is a professor at the Canada and Canada Research Chair in Game Studies and Design at Concordia University. She will be presenting That's Not a Real Game, How Game Studies, Gamers, and Game Culture Serve as Gatekeepers for Legitimacy in Games. Um, before I tell you a little bit about her, uh, I'll tell you that we are going to keep the microphones off uh, and, and we'll open those up during the Q&A at the end. So just, um, it, just trying to make sure that we don't have any folks joining us who are uninvited, which we did have about a week ago. So just being cautious on that and sorry for silencing folks. Um, and, and also next week at this time, we will be having a, an alumni event of speakers from our master's programs, which certainly you're all invited to join us as well. So with that said, a little bit about our speaker today, as mentioned, Dr. Consalvo is a professor in Canada Research Chair in Game Studies and Design at Concordia University in Montreal. She is the co-author of Real Games, What's Legitimate and What's Not in Contemporary Video Games and Players and Their Pets gaming communities from bed at a sunset. She is also co-editor of Sports Video Games and the Handbook of Internet Studies and is the author of Cheating Gaining Advantage in Video Games as well as Atari to Zelda Japan's Video Games in Global Context. Uh, Dr. Consalvo runs the M Lab, a space dedicated to developing innovative methods for studying games and game players. She's a member of the Center of Technoculture, Art and Games, known as TAG, and has presented her work at industry as well as academic conferences, including regular presentations at the Game Developers Conference. She is the past president of the Digital Games Research Association and has held positions at MIT, Ohio University, Chubu University of Japan, and the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. So thank you very much, Professor Consalvo, for joining us today. The microphone is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> um, this is my first virtual talk like this. And strangely, even though I've been using Zoom for my classes, they're mostly discussion based. So I haven't done a lot of like lecturing or slide sharing. So please bear with me if things go wonky. Uh, let me share my screen to get going. And okay. So, and, and I should note that, um, okay, so first, uh, Chris Paul is the co-author of this book. Uh, so please also thank him because these insights and ideas are equally his. And um, you may hear a co-presenter today. Um, my small pickle dog, Samantha, is in the room and I can't control her. So uh, if you hear some barking, that is where it's coming from. So um, this project began back in the day, uh, more than 10 years ago now. Some of you may remember this game. It was actually in the news recently because it just shut down. Uh, but Farmville sort of took the world by storm in the early 2000s, mid 2000s. And this was one of the first you know, games on Facebook to really make it big. And you were either you know, like a lover or a hater. Uh, most people didn't have like a a middling opinion of it. And that's what made it so interesting for me um, as like a researcher and also a game player to think about. But also, you know, Farmville wasn't the only social game. And um, these are some of the games also released during that time period. Um, so you can walk down memory lane if you would like to, if you were an active Facebook user. Um, but Facebook games were this new sort of game um, that appeared and they were called lots of things, Facebook games, social games, social network games. But the idea was, you know, you were using um, your friends as resources, you were playing along with your friends, usually in an asynchronous way. Um, you were collecting and gathering things. Um, there might be some light competition, often there was not. And usually you, usually you were building and, and interacting with the worlds themselves. And you might see here, just to give you a sense of the, the size or the magnitude, uh, this was the app leaderboard for May in 2011. And the top game here at the time was Cityville, um, but you can see here on the right 
Zynga had 248 million monthly active users. And so they were, um, you know, the undisputed kings at that period of time. And even though um, like these games were hugely popular, there was actually quite a bit of backlash. And you saw this especially in the popular press and with a lot of game developers. And this is one of the more famous quotes. Uh, Jonathan Blow, who created the indie sensation Braid, uh, said it in an interview, you know, do you believe social games are evil? I mean, it's obviously a loaded question even to begin with, but yes, absolutely. Like there's, there's no middle ground here. And lots of developers felt this way that um, social games and games like uh, Farmville were not just bad, um, but were ruining uh, the game ecosystem, were ruining game development. And this led uh, Chris and I to ask this question <clears throat> because it wasn't just that um, these developers were saying these games were evil or horrible, um, but some of them were saying they weren't even real games to begin with. Um, they were questioning their legitimacy. So it's not just that they were buggy or that they promoted, you know, like uh, bad forms of purchasing behavior, but that uh, they didn't even deserve the title of game. You can see here on the right, um, this was Chris and I, our characters from Kim Kardashian Hollywood, another early social game. And, um, you know, another game sort of question as is this legitimate or not? And the one at the bottom is uh, probably World of Warcraft and a more legitimate real game. But rather than coming at this from the angle of what is a game, which game scholars have thought about for quite a while, um, you know, we thought about, well, what's not a game? What are, um, when the press, when developers, when gamers are talking about what makes a game real or not, when they're saying something isn't a game, you know, what is it that is making it lack in gameliness or gameness? And so that's where our investigation began. We initially did uh, one paper for uh, the Foundations of Digital Games Conference, I think in 2012. And then we had so much to say that we ended up uh, writing a book but Chris found this great quote um, from a 16 year old video game expert. This is how this person was cited in Newsweek in 1988 with his, and of course it was a guy, uh, his definition of what a game is. He said that arcane simulations requiring thick instruction manuals aren't games to me. A game is something with action and a joystick and firing the buttons and shooting the aliens. So, Aside from scholars who may have, you know, definitions about what a game might be, other people have serious opinions about what games are. And so we thought this is something worth investigating. And we did this through the lens of constitutive rhetoric. And here we were drawing on a framework developed uh, by actually my former colleague here at Concordia, Maurice Charland. Uh, he developed this concept to help explain um, the positioning that the Quebecois have done um, in relation to Canada. And he talked about it as how messages can bring audiences into being. When you're writing something with a subject and you're positioning them within a narrative, you are creating them as a subject. You know, the Quebecois were saying, we are a people, um, you know, we are a li linguistic minority, you know, we have status, we have rights. And that this public discourse creates not just the subject position, we are the Quebecois, but directives for action. You know, we demand justice. We want legislation to ensure our rights, like within Canada, but then also within Quebec. And of course, uh, Chris had come up with this and, you know, sent it to me sitting in Quebec. And I'm like, huh, good framework, good model. So I'm going to talk about how games have been constituted within um, the popular media, within like games media and by gamers, um, but also at the very end by um, game studies itself, because how game studies talks about games, how we define games and the games that we use to study and as exemplars has implications for the field. And if you look back at our original paper, we had four areas that we felt that were commonly referenced when somebody was positioning a game as real or not real. So there was the developer who made the game. Um, there were game mechanics. So the things that you can do in the game, can you shoot? Can you run? Can you jump? Do you solve puzzles? Uh, celebrations of depth and complexity. So is the game very immersive? How long does it take to play? 
um, you know, is it very complex or is it very simple? And then finally, the payment structure. You know, do you purchase the game as a one-off? Do you um, uh, have a monthly subscription? Is it a free-to-play game? And when we, that was the original paper. And then when we uh, wrote the book, we collapsed into three areas. So there's the developer, the payment structure, and then mechanics, depth and complexity uh, became part of one chapter where we were talking about like formal game elements themselves. And we make the argument that that area, the mechanics, depth and complexity was sort of a flashpoint at the time when we were studying, um, you know, the mid to late 2000s uh, into like early 2010s. Um, but that these can change over time as games change over time. And today I'm just going to go into a little bit about the developer side of things. So how do developers uh, place a stamp of legitimacy or not on a game? And then I'm going to talk about real game studies. And so for the developer side of things, uh, we talked about a few in the book and Zynga was one of the first. But Zynga is an easy target, as I mentioned, they made Farmville. Uh, the CEO, Mark Pincus, was like unabashedly quoted as saying, you know, like, I don't care about innovation. We will copy whoever, you know, we need to copy. We're just about making money. So they were never positioned very well within the industry in terms of uh, like their legitimacy or their uh, sense of like caring about games as an art form, you know, not just a business form or even about like legitimate ways to make money. Um, you know, and there were lots of uh, references to scams in like how uh, Zynga um, made money off its customers. So instead I'm gonna focus on two, king.com and .gears. Um, a, lot, a lot of times you would think like if a developer, you know, are they legitimate or not, that big necessarily equals bad and small, like scrappy and indie is good. And this is meant to challenge that a little bit. So um, King.com, um, you've probably played one of their games in the past, if you aren't still now, makes a bunch of saga games. You can see a few here, but they're really most well known for Candy Crush Saga. And in around 2014 or so, the company had uh, prepared to go public. And to go public, to do an IPO, they had to release a lot of their financial documents to show that they were financially stable and worth investing in. And as part of that, um, they had announced, you know, they had over a, 180 game properties. So they had lots of games. However, a single game accounted for 93 million of the 128 million daily active users and basically two thirds of that revenue, one game. This was that one game, right? And so it was like hugely important to the company. You know, qu questions were asked by the press, you know, like if this game tanks, like this company is worth nothing, like they have nothing to fall back on. And so the company was put in this position of really having to shore up the value of this one particular game, right? Because it was hugely important to them. So what did they do? They went on the offensive. Uh, if you remember, if you followed the games press at the time, they trademarked, they put in a trademark application for the word candy. They said that uh, they wanted to own rights to the word candy um, for use in apparel, video games, gambling services, amusement parks, computer hardware, and more. This was in January of 2014. And they wanted to, they started to contact developers who had the word candy in the title of their game that were released after them saying, trademark infringement, you must remove, you must remove this. And small developers um, were saying things like, you know, like, I am one person, I developed this small game. King has an army of lawyers, like there's no way I can fight this. I guess I'll just have to change the name of my game. And there was huge outcry in the press uh, in terms of like, how dare this one big company kind of step in and say that they can trademark just like a generic noun like candy. Candy was not the only word they tried to trademark. Um, they also went to bat over the term saga uh, because as you know, saga was used in most of their game titles. They went after the small company Stoic, uh, which makes the Norse mythology game, the Banner Saga. Uh, one reporter said, you know, this game has as much to do with King's Candy Crush Saga as a wet tea towel in a cement mixer. Uh, but King was like, you use the term saga. We don't want people to confuse your game with our products. 
And again, this did not paint King in a very positive light. Sort of in response, King published this open letter saying, at its simplest, our policy is to protect our IP and also respect others. And we just want to preserve our ability to protect our own games. Like this seems very nice and you know, calming, like we're just trying to do business, you know, you do what you, you do you, we'll do us. However, as I mentioned, King tried to produce, you know, control the word candy. Candy Crush Saga had come out in 2012. There was a game called Candy Swipe that had come out in 2010. It looked remarkably similar. Candy Swipe was created by one guy, Albert Ransom. Uh, it was in homage to his mother who had died previously of cancer and she had enjoyed candy, I guess, a lot. And he created this game and suddenly King went after him saying, you can't use, yeah, you, you have to take this game down. It's too similar to ours. Um, you use the word candy, this has to go. And Ransom is saying, my game came out before yours. Like, how, how, how do you go back in time to do that? Well, what King had done is tried to purchase Candy Crusher, a game that came out in 2004. This was a game, um, you can see here the gameplay on the right. It's got candy in it, but is very different um, from Candy Crush and also uh, Ransom's game in terms of like its actual gameplay and its graphics. Uh, but King was trying to purchase this game to preemptively say, no, 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 we have always, you know, held rights to the term candy. And uh, this was, as you can imagine, poorly received. At about this time, um, King's revenue started to tumble a little bit. It was getting crushed in the media in terms of like, it, you know, it's trying to like stomp on small developers. They ended up ultimately settling uh, with all of the indies. They did not make them remove their games. They did not make them change their names. Um, you know, they basically were like, all right, we will, we will back away. But at this point, the damage had been done. You know, King was really firmly positioned now as not a legitimate game developer. You know, they were constantly setting their army of lawyers and patent and trademark applications against, you know, indie developers. Um, they were taking, you know, these extreme actions to discourage developers. They were not, you know, respecting the art or the craft of game developing, and they were trying to limit the options of what's available to consumers, you know, buy a game to shut it down so that you can control the word candy. So the first conclusion here, you know, that you could say is, okay, so this is a big corporation, right? Um, real game developers are small, scrappy, and seek to work with others to make more real games for us to play. However, the second case study is Flappy Bird and Dong Nguyen. And this is a game from 2013 to about 2014. Um, Flappy Bird was created by uh, the studio Dot Gears, who is a one person studio. This is Dong Nguyen. Um, he is in Vietnam. And he had actually created a few games, mobile games before this and had originally released Flappy Bird. Um, he tried to get it released on the Mac OS uh, store as Flap Flap, uh, but that name was already taken. And so he changed it to Flappy Bird um, and it came out later that year. And if you play the game um, or if you didn't, this is what it looks like. You control the little bird. Um, you can see here on the left, you basically use the touch screen and you just touch the bird and it goes, it goes up. And so and if left to its own devices, it will sink down. And so you're trying to tap it up to get it. I'm, I'm pointing at my screen as if you can see me pointing with my finger. Um, <laughs> you're trying to get it between the pipes. And it's incredibly hard. You usually die right away. Um, you know, like a good score can be a score of like three. And um, as it says here, extremely addictive, simple graphics and gameplay. That is it in a nutshell. This is like a graph of when the game had been released and then uh, its downloads. It was actually out for quite a while. Nobody paid attention to it. It didn't get any reviews really. Um, it didn't get any sales until suddenly, you know, like in early 2014, it just exploded. And then it was making thousands of dollars a day in revenue. And this was reported in the game's media and people were asking questions like, 
hmm, I don't know about this. Are there, are, is this developer using bots to like raise like the, the reviews and the attention just to get it in? Because why would it suddenly explode in popularity? This was not the only negative press the game received. Um, the game was uh, compared um, to this early game um, helicopter game. Uh, it said that um, Flappy Bird had stolen the mechanic Helicopter is a 2011 game where you're also tapping the helicopter to get it to go above or below the bars that you see here. Um, Pew Pew, another game it was said to be uh, ripping off where you were a little bird flying between cacti. Here you can see that, um, you know, they're showing how these birds look suspiciously familiar from one game to the next. And, you know, there's this other game that people said it might have been taking art from. Uh, you know, gee, that Mario franchise where, you know, those uh, pipes seem to be coming from. And all of this discourse is pointing at this game where the developer is making a lot of money off of something that is largely stolen or ripped from other, other games, right? Like the art is ripped off, the gameplay idea is ripped off, you know, it's not sure it's this legitimate, like how and why it's making money. And, you know, this is just kind of problematic. This is from um, Kotaku. I don't know if you can see, um, they changed the actual title of this article after a few days. Here it's saying making $50,000 a day on Mario-like art, but the URL shows the original title was a day off ripped art. Um, they later apologized and said they reached out to um, Nguyen, you know, to offer their apologies, um, but <clears throat> the damage had been done. And people had, uh, it had become extremely popular. Um, lots of people were downloading it, saying that they were playing it obsessively. And Nguyen suddenly said, um, I can't take this, like this pressure, you know, people are saying it's destroying their life because they're addicted. I'm taking it off the, the OS store. This caused another rage of, you know, another rash of outrage. People said, how can you do this? You know, he had death threats, uh, but following those 22 hours, the game was, was done and gone. He had removed it. And, you know, with that, suddenly the press sort of stepped back and questioned, you know, like, what have we done? Um, you know, what, did we unfairly accuse this person? This flappy jam appeared where indie developers um, did a game jam where you were supposed to create a game as sort of inspired by Flappy Bird. And uh, it was hugely successful. There were more than 700 contributions uh, when the jam was done. And there were some indie, some well-known indie developers who had contributed. So let me just find my notes here. Um, Maverick Bird was created by Super Hexagon creator, Terry Cavanaugh which um, was quoted as being a whole lot of fun. The game may seem like a clone of classic games like Helicopter or even contemporary games like Jetpack Joyride, but the flap action is what sets it apart. You don't hold a button to go up and down and let it sink. You have to constantly hit the flap button to move in a parabola. His take on the premise isn't nearly as punishing as the original. And then there was Flappy Balt um, created by Adam Saltman who created Cannabalt. And this was uh, described as another simple game that uses the basic ideas of Flappy Bird, but turns it into something a bit more interesting, almost claustrophobic, but much more enjoyable. And so you get this distinction being drawn between the original game created by hmm, somebody from Vietnam, an Asian person who's an outsider to the community as being ripped off and copied, but well-known indie developers are creating things that are an homage or inspired by the original. And so, you know, uh, Ian Bogos called Nguyen an outsider artist, but he was one of the few who, you know, accorded uh, the developer any respect. Instead, uh, Robert Yang wrote in his blog that, you know, basically Nguyen committed the crime of being from Vietnam. If he were a white American, this would have been the story of a scrappy indie who managed to best Zynga with his loving homage to Nintendo's apparent patent on green pixel pipes and the classic helicopter cave game genre. Instead, Flappy Bird's derivative nature is confirmation that technologically backward Southeast Asians were at it again, stealing and cloning hard-won innovation in games invented by more beloved developers. I think that pretty much sums it up. 
Another problem that Nguyen had was that he mainly communicated by Twitter and English was you know, not his first language. His tweets um, have a lot of simplified or broken English. And there weren't a lot of interviews with him to sort of counter this. And so he came across as sort of, a, you know, basically someone who didn't have command of English, uh, someone who questionably had command of game development, you know, who was stealing and um, this had, you know, negative implications. And he was making a lot of money that people, you know, questioned like his, the legitimacy of making that money. And so you can see here, you know, art, gameplay mechanics and design can be described, you know, as either borrowed um, ripped, you know, copied, or in homage. I mean, in, they take on different valences, no matter what they are. And use depends on the developer in question. You know, are you an insider to the community, or an, are you an outsider? Are you legitimate? And also, if you're making too much money, um, that can also throw your status into question. So, you know, like an indie developer who's just making enough money to survive can be seen as more legitimate than someone who's raking in $50,000 a day. So his race and his outsider status worked against his credibility. Um, but, you know, the, then the industry itself sort of rallied around him, uh, but then they were feted for this homage. And so even indies themselves, you know, aren't always legitimate game developers. You have to be the right kind of indie game developer. Let me just check my time here. So um, let me go for hopefully another five or seven minutes and then we can open it up for questions. So you can see here, you know, the large, the nameless faceless corporations will always be suspect. There are some large corporations that do get more of a pass than others in the book. We talk about like Blizzard uh, seems to get more than its share of deserving love from game developers, uh, but this can change over time. Aggressively targeting other developers will call your pedigree into question. So are you staying in your own lane or are you trying to control all the lanes? Everybody copies, but who you are relative to what you copy matters. And being white or being an insider is a big plus. So basically real games are made by corporations if they show they care about the wider game community and indies if they are part of an established community and developers don't use bots or tricky legal tactics. So real game studies, us or me. So there are different ways that game studies as a field um, has you know engaged in gatekeeping and we argue that one of those ways is how we define a game itself and these are just some early definitions of games that we found um, there are tons more and people are still trying to come up with definitions and it's not that they are necessarily bad or terrible. Um, they have been contested. As you can see, there are slightly different flavors for each of them. And of these three, Jespers has probably come under the most attack. And for the, um, you know, where is the part here? Um, quantifiable outcome, right? This is the part where uh, a lot of debate comes in. And because Jesper at the time, and he has since sort of changed his position a bit, um, but when this definition came out, people rightly argued that something like The Sims could not be considered a game because it does not have a quantifiable outcome. And as somebody who is more of a post-structuralist, I, I never a fan of, of categories and, and of uh, simple definitions because they, they box out all of the interesting deviations, um, you know, and the things that we exclude the, the marginalized. Um, but he's since you know changed his mind a bit but this does have important implications then if you know like you're looking for funding or you're trying to categorize uh something you know that fits uh versus something that doesn't of course what's missing these are all aesthetic uh these are all formal uh versions of what gets to be called a game but there's also that history and context Think back to that definition from the 16 year old that was quoted in Newsweek. You know, for him, it was joysticks and shooting. And really, you know, like we still have shooting in games, uh, but we don't have as many joysticks anymore. But for him, this was an important element of what a game was. I didn't mention here, but also in the book, 
we looked at early game reviews from like PC magazines from the 1980s and reviews of games. And one of the things that made a game a really good game was extensive documentation, right? Uh, those thick manuals. We don't have those anymore because we have a lot more tutorials built into games. But just to say that these are elements that, you know, outside of a formal aesthetic definition can constitute what makes something real or a good game for people. And these are things that can change over time. Another important element um, for game studies is the games that we study, because what we pay attention to, what we write about confers legitimacy on those games uh, and on those games genres. Like if you look at early game studies, games like Myst, Tomb Raider and EverQuest, you know, were everywhere. That's what everybody was talking about um, or games like them, games like Doom. Um, there was a study that came out recently that looked at the articles in game studies journals of the two popular journals and the digital library of the Digital Games Research Association that found that MMOs like EverQuest and World of Warcraft, virtual worlds, first person shooters and role playing games accounted for 50% of all the games that were studied. Now this isn't a perfect uh, study itself because it ignores books, which may go into depth about other types of games. It didn't look at studies of players which may have, who may have been playing different types of games. But I think anybody who's familiar with game studies would say that this feels um, pretty accurate and that there are certainly other types of games that are hugely popular in terms of their popular audience, but just aren't paid attention to. And in a way, this means that, you know, we're losing knowledge, we're, um, we're ignoring certain types of games like sports games, racing games, uh, games for children that um, may give us important insights. You know, lots of people are playing them, but why are they? We don't know. So just to, um, update this, I went this morning to the front page of the Game Studies Journal to see uh, what the latest research is there. And I'm not picking on people in particular, but I was just curious, like, what are the games that might be mentioned? So here you've got Dead by Daylight, which is a popular horror game, Pillars of Eternity 2, which is a computer role-playing game. Um, there's one about gameplay. There's one about grades on games, studying and college GPAs. I'm not sure what it says. Um, solitary role play, um, player customization, and Counter Strike Global Offensive, so another first person game, and then uh, Dark Souls. And I would point out here that uh, the solitary role play, this is uh, an interesting advancement. Like we are seeing some ground being broken in terms of non-digital games, uh, finally getting more attention in the game studies community. Folks who have studied um, tabletop games, card games, live action role play, LARPs have argued for years that, you know, these games also need to be taken seriously, that um, there are important insights we can gain that go back and forth between the different types of players or games, but also there are important elements of those games that are particular to them that we should understand. Um, so, you know, it's great to see folks like Yako and Tanya, um, you know, moving this field forward. But as you can see here, just from this quick example, like we are still relying on a lot of uh, well-known, um, well-trod uh, genres of games. So I would just say, you know, to kind of close up, here are a few areas where I think we, we could use more attention. So this is just the front page from itch.io which features a lot of indie games. And by indie, I mean even beyond like scrappy indie to um, like one person, two person games. You know, these are the product of game jams, uh, students who make games, individuals who make games on their own. You can see here, these are for sale, but um, many more on this site are for free. Um, and there's been like very little attention to this like broader swath of games. Certain genres I had mentioned before, like sports or racing games, dating sims, you know, are becoming hugely popular and they're much broader in their scope than the early Japanese games, which focused mainly on, you know, like sexualized young women and the men who like tried to date them. Uh, you know, this one is about, I'm not sure even, dating dogs. <laughs> 
I haven't played it, <laughs> but it's recommended to me because it's on sale. So maybe I'll try it out. And um, another important area, I used to look at Big Fish, uh, which made hidden object games. And you know, there's been folks like Shira Chess um, and Chris Paul have also looked at casual games, which have moved to mobile um, and invest in express games. The sort of the successors to games like Farmville, where you build and you um, manage things or simulation games. But there's this huge area um, where games uh, overlap with gambling. And some of it involves real money, some of it doesn't. It's this really bizarre kind of gray area. And Big Fish has become a huge player, Big Fish in it, ha ha ha. Uh, they're based in Seattle and there's been almost nothing you know, done to examine this. And you know, it's just hugely important. So to sum up, I would say that what we um, as players, as academics and as culture legitimize as real um, and not real has consequences. You know, these are not just words. I didn't go into here, but in the book we talk about how developers, for example, sometimes would make a game that was supposed to be released on PC and mobile, and they would delay the release of the mobile version simply because to have the PC version come out first um, legitimized the game for certain players. If it came out on mobile first or at the same time, people would question like whether it was worth playing. So it had a real impact on their bottom line. It also has impacts on the people who were admitted to the community. You know, we saw this with Gamergate, we saw this long before, we continue to see it now. You know, who is allowed to talk about games, allowed to show interest, allowed to be seen as, you know, like legitimate in this group, um, whose opinions get to count more than others. And certain activities, games and groups are valorized, whereas others are ignored or harassed. So basically, when we define things, we're setting the goalposts for inclusion and exclusion. I mean, it, it's kind of how we understand things in culture, like, but we need to think carefully about who we're excluding, about what we're excluding and why. And for games, at least, we need to consider bringing more people, more games, and more experiences into the circle. Thank you very much. Oh, Patrick, you're muted. You muted me. <laughs> Probably a good thing. Uh, th th thank you very much, Mia. That was that was wonderful. The the case example is very illuminating. Uh, it, it, this is just a comment. It seems like King uh, is almost like the Monsanto of the gaming world. Or at least it was for a period. It struck yeah. me there. <laughs> so um, I'd like to open this up for questions for everyone. Um, and uh, Mia, do we want to just unmute all, I think? Maybe that's the way to go. All right, we should be in a position where folks can, can ask questions. If you kind of raise your, your yellow hand, we can identify who is, uh, who's out there and wants to ask a question. Well, feel free to jump in. Hector. And yeah, very nice uh, talk. Uh, I've had a few questions, but I guess I'll, I'll just leave the one, well, and, and the two sections of your talk. The first was on the um, definitions that the gamer communities yeah. develop, and the other is on the game study side of things, right? So the first is, um, is, is the question of legitimacy. What do we, what's the definition in, of legitimate, right? Are we talking about um, authenticity, some sort of, um, frame where the, the game design company is shown to be authentic, right? There's a, no PR spin. Or is it social proof? Is it, well, everybody says, right? It's the old sociological persuasion idea that everybody says you're an expert, therefore you must be an expert. So is the legitimacy a social proof phenomenon? Or is, what what is what are you defining it and what would they say is legitimate? Right, good question. I think 
for us, it was more about the authenticity side of things, you know, because there was this constant reference back to what real what real developers were like, such that um, everybody had to make money, um, but you had to care about the craft of making games. So for example, I mentioned Blizzard as, you know, being cited by a lot of people as being real or legitimate um, because they get attention for things like um, their games take a long time in development. Like they, they say they won't release a game until it's ready. Uh, they've canceled development of games, you know, even if they've been in development for multiple years because they just can't find the fun. Like that was one of their quotes about in one of their interviews. And so they're presented as someone who, you know, obviously they need to make money, but they will not sacrifice like the art or the craft of making games um, just to make money, as opposed to somebody like Zynga who is totally willing to sacrifice anything, you know, to make the money. And so it, it, it falls back on that discourse of you're, you're an artist, you're a creator. And um, it wasn't out at the time, but like Nancy Bame's book on um, music makers, you know, and musicians now. She talks about like relational labor and this idea of authenticity. Like you have to present yourself as a person, not just, you know, like a, like a series of, of records or albums that are being created and released. And it's like the, the developers have to perform that in a way um, to show that, you know, their stuff is worth um, consuming. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I guess in, in terms of, the, in other words, they're not a sellout. Right. Yeah. So it's the, it's, but it's connected to historically to what people have been saying about when an artist becomes no longer of the people, right? They sold out. Right. Exactly. That's why like Blizzard, even though they're a huge company, um, you know, they can still like when they're interviewed, they talk about finding the fun or, um, you know, like being true to players. And so, yeah, like they're saying, you know, like trust us, you know, like we're still, oh, and they, they talk a lot about uh, being gamers themselves, you know, so they're not like King, King is the, the series of faceless suits um, versus, you know, Blizzard or Riot does this a lot. You know, they're like, we're all gamers. We're just like you, you know? And so we, we know what you want because we want the same thing. So it's, it's that performance of like gamerness even you know, like um so that's why you know like you should believe us and you should trust us okay. got a question from uh joanne say yes um so i guess my question is more so about where a specific game i was thinking of like animal crossing fits uh within your research because the thing I've noticed is across the board a lot of people who like to either game casually or like are hardcore gamers part of the community really love that game and it doesn't necessarily fit the mold I think of what the usual definition of a good game is so I'm wondering what you think about that and what maybe contributes to that sort of definition of success I know you mentioned that maybe the legitimacy of the corporation or uh, developers is a key part of it, but I wanted to know your opinion. Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's, and the discourse only exists as much as people give it legitimacy. You know, like there's, there's lots of people who play Candy Crush who really could care, couldn't care less, you know, about like what the popular media says about the game. Just like there were people, millions of people who played Facebook games who were like, I love them, they're great. So, you know, it's, there's a certain discourse and you can choose to accept it or not, or, you know, some people aren't even paying attention. And I think like with Animal Crossing, you have like a huge, a huge enough audience. Some of them, like I'm saying, they're like that. And you saw that, especially with the pandemic and the huge rise in gameplay, right? Like they don't, they don't read games media. They don't know what Polygon is. They've never been to Steam and that's just fine. And then you have, you know, another segment that is uh, part of that group. And like, I would say Nintendo is like a really interesting case because um, they, in a way, 
they're faceless and in a way they're not like they have Shigeru Miyamoto and they will you know delay games forever you know until they are perfect so they buy into that rhetoric um but at the same time when they released the Wii they were saying very specifically you know like we're not getting we're not going to trap ourselves in that um very narrow rhetoric of, of like who's a gamer right and like who plays video games and they've they've sort of walked that line deftly you know they they constantly get critiqued you know people will say you know if a console doesn't sell well like it's done for nintendo they should just get out of consoles and, and make games because they make games very well um but and then they then they prove them wrong um but i think there are I mean, there are some books about Nintendo, but there should be even more books just about Nintendo and their games and like what makes them so interesting. Thank, thanks for your question, Joanne. Uh, Professor Fink has got his hand up and we've got a couple in the chat. So let's go with Professor Fink first and then we'll get to those chat questions. Yeah, thank you very much for that presentation. It was a fascinating presentation because I know nothing about this subject pretty much, <laughs> except I know of people who play, who play the game and I, have to, and I usually bother them to prevent them from doing that. <laughs> um, but what struck me is, is this, what you presented was well situated in our century and our year even. Mm -hmm. And uh, I immediately thought, maybe it wasn't a good thing or a bad thing, but I immediately thought of, there's a book by Johan Heusinger, who's Dutch. Yep named Homo Ludens yep. about, and uh, I just looked up on my phone to see what year it was that it came out. It came out in 1938. Yeah. And it's, and that was, and it's about play and the role of play in culture and society. And it struck me that the, the attributes that you discuss about, you know, corporate life and what's innovative to the, to the recipient or the audience of the games, I think is very, very fascinating, but I'm thinking about whether or not for play or sport, there's a broader, broader typology um, that might be theoretically interesting to deal with the role of, of play and sport and how that, re how that appears or doesn't appear or is reflected or is not reflected in uh, the, the, the games and the, 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 the work about games that you presented. So that's an enormous question. So that's why I'm giving it to you. Okay. <laughs> Well, I will say that, um, I mean, Huizinga is actually widely cited in game studies. Um, you know, his work, Homo Ludens, has, has been hugely influential. Um, like if you go back to even like my first book and like all the first books in game studies, and he's still cited now, as well as like uh, Roger Calois um, was writing about man playing games and um, some other early writing as well. So folks went back to you know, like sociologists, um, historians, you know, cultural history scholars. Uh, Wittgenstein has written about games and play. And so, you know, like as the field was developing, you know, we were looking at what's been said prior to digital games because, you know, digital games are just the latest instantiation of gameplay, which goes back millennia. So you're right, like it's got this huge history. I just didn't draw on it um, for this part. But a lot of that early writing is foundational in the field. And actually, it's funny, there's, a, I found this summer, a great piece. I think her name is Margaret Duncan. I'll have to dig up the citation. She wrote it in the 80s. And it was a, like, basically a critical discourse analysis of Homo Ludens. Mm. And she was talking about the, the classist way that he wrote about, you know, play and that only certain people were allowed to engage in play because they had the free time available. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's important for us to like go back to, you know, to see what has been written about play because a lot of the stuff still is uh, relevant and important, but also then to situate it like in its time and, you know, and to critique it. And, you know, we're starting to see a lot more of that now. Yeah, I can just write a quick comment about that. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the great sociologists talked about golf and saying mm -hmm. you play golf if you if you could afford a, a golf right. you know, place to play it on and you have all that land that you can give up and you're not going to have cattle on it, you're going to have golf players. And it was that kind of uh, uh, idea about golf being a classist yeah. 
fastest uh, form of play. Yep, exactly. And you need your clubs and you need to take lessons and you need the time to go and yeah. You need a caddy. Yeah, <laughs> and a cart, and a cart. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thanks, Ed, thanks for that question. And <clears throat> Twain also said golf is the best way to screw up a good walk, but yeah. that's on another issue, <laughs> Mark, Mark Twain. Um, we've got a couple that I can read here from the chat. Uh, Alyssa is asking, what is a common misconception people have regarding the legit legitimacy of games? And let me also read the one from Michelle, mm -hmm. which is uh, about developers and being gamers themselves. Interesting. Mihoyo, which gained a lot of popularity, literally has their slogan, tech otakus, I'm not sure what that is, save the world, which is very familiar, which is very similar to the Blizzard uh, does in interviews, what Blizzard does in interviews. Right. So I'm assuming that that's gamer language you'll understand. So let's yes. go with those two questions. <laughs> Tech otakus, yeah. Um, in terms of a common misconception, mm, uh, I think, so one thing we go into more detail in the book about is with mobile games, there's been a lot of um, hate directed and a lot of critique directed at mobile as a form of games, right? That they're not real. And part of that is this belief that they are cheap to develop, quick to develop, um, you know, and, and that must mean that they're easy to develop. And as I even mentioned previously, a lot of developers can try and do like the game across multiple releases, uh, multiple platforms. So they'll try and release the same game on, plat on, on mobile, PC, Mac, you know, on your Xbox, whatever. Um, and it doesn't mean that the, the mobile version is the simplified or dumbed down one. Um, sometimes it can be the more complex one and um, that doesn't make it less legitimate, but that's what comes to mind right away. And just to answer that next question from Sarah, could a game today get the same quick fame as Flappy Bird and Candy Crush? I would say yes, Among Us is probably the best example of that right now which was also another game that was out for a while and then became hugely popular and then got huge boosts because, you know, like uh, celebrities played it. You're muted again. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> Nicole Messina's had her hand up for quite a while. Let's get Nicole in and then okay. uh, Ryan, we'll get to you next in the chat, sorry. Actually, I was going to ask a question on Jack's behalf, but it looks like he and his internet are back on. So if you want to pass it on to him, I forgot to take my hand down. All right, internet is good. Can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to hear your opinion on what you think the biggest challenge is for grad students that are studying game studies right now. I know that's a huge question, but. <laughs> um, hmm. Let's see. Or I guess who are interested it, in similar, similar things that you are. Basically. Right. Yeah. It, um, I've been lucky in that I've been at places where people either take my work seriously or weren't sure what to make of it, but were like, well, you're publishing, so you seem to be <laughs> doing fine. But there are still folks who run into problems, like in terms of like having, you know, their work taken seriously and like what's the legitimacy of, of game studies itself as a field. And um, I mean, you still see a lot of game studies research that starts off with the numbers like games are bigger than film, they're bigger than this, they're bigger than that. And it's, it, I think part of that is just proving that. And I mean, demonstrably, they are huge. I don't think we need to make that argument anymore. And I think that honestly, as horrible as the pandemic has been, it has shown how games have become an important or reinforced for people, like their social role. You know, you've seen folks playing like Animal Crossing or Among Us or um, like doing tabletop games via like Twitch, you know, in spaces like that. And it's shown that they're not just games played by like lonely people in their basements. Like this is a, a, a social thing 
uh, that it's part of culture. You are seeing now, like I mentioned among us, like AOC, when she was playing the game, like uh, politicians now are starting to play. And so I think, you know, it's, we still have a ways to go for some folks, but like getting that, you know, like making that argument, you know, we still need to do that um, and, and keep reinforcing that. And I will be curious to see like once like lockdowns end and, you know, we can go back, like, will there be like a backlash against games, you know, like get away from your screens, go outside, um, or will we um, still keep this like positive association that has, you know, suddenly appeared with games? Does that help answer? Okay. Thank you for that question. Uh, Ryan Daly writes, I'd be curious to hear you talk more about games like The Sims, which are coded as feminine and queer, mm. but brushed aside as casual and less than by more hardcore gamers audiences. Right, so yeah, I mean, things have changed a lot since the original Sims came out and the weird thing is games like The Sims, which are, you're right, like coded as feminine or as, um, you know, for women, if you look at the audience breakdowns, it was still something like 60% of players were female. I mean, there were still 40% men who were playing them. It's just that because it was actually majority women that suddenly the games got like denigrated in this way. But we've seen such a shift in terms of the available outlets for where to talk about games with Twitch, even, you know, like with the stream with variety um, gaming becoming more popular that people can find their niche, just like with TV, there's no more like three big channels and you just have to choose one of them. Like you can, you know, like with Net Netflix diversify, I think with games as well, there's an increasing, you know, diversity and it's, it's more accepted, like, I'm in this little corner where I play The Sims and I know like all the Twitch streamers who play The Sims and, and like, that's cool. Um, but in terms of like the game industry itself, um, there's still a bit of floundering going on. Um, you saw this, especially four or five years ago um, when things like moved away from AAA and sort of this core to having to grapple with like mobile is huge and how do we understand that or VR is going to be a thing or social games are a thing. And so there's like this, this group that still tries to insist on the core and like the Assassin's Creed and Call of Duties, which do make billions of dollars, but there are increasingly more spaces for, you know, many other types of games. And I just like to see them getting more attention so that we know like games aren't just the latest Assassin's Creed game. Thank you. Uh, another question from the chat from John Francis on legitimacy residing in the gamers developers. What do you feel of the balance with journalists, particularly changing review policies and specifically game journalists and the mocking of mainstream press journalists who could not beat um, or advance far in a game? Oh, I'm just reading that question again because it's a, it's a challenging one. Um, I think, again, this is part of that whole insiders, ex, you know, outsiders, you know, we, ha we have the goalposts or we want to control the goalposts. And it goes back to this fear that games are a zero sum game. Like if and, and you saw this with a lot of developers when, when Farmville and other games like that got big. It was suddenly this sense that, well, if we're gonna have Farmville and more games like that, it means that we're gonna have less games for me, right, that I like. And if we have these, you know, like mainstream reviewers reviewing games and they're bad at them, like it means that they're not paying attention to the games that I want to have paid attention to. And as I was just saying, I think that we're just seeing more diversity in terms of the games and the outlets and the, the reviewers and the writers. And so it's, uh, it's not really a valid concern. Um, it's just that for some people, this activity is so tied into their identity that it feels like a threat. Yeah, no, I have a, <laughs> I have a question, which is that I know that one thing that's been kind of happening uh, 
one thing that's been happening is that we saw during kind of 2016 election that the Trump campaign, really Steve Bannon was able to use the kind of movement around Gamergate to spread a lot of people who are maybe just had grievances over video games into kind of like extremist political movements. And a lot of the culture around gaming has now been connected to kind of the spread of uh, hatred and also uh, threats online. And this has become a major issue in terms of freedom of speech. So really going forward, uh, do you think that social scientists should be looking kind of to video games and other popular culture as kind of an area where they can see where flashpoints might develop and then just kind of where do you think that these will go in future years? Excellent question. Um, I mean, there's no question that there's a lot of toxicity surrounding games still, and that's not going away. And I think there's a lot of toxicity in online culture and just culture generally, but games have had this problem for a long time. And, you know, the game companies continue to, to grapple with it. And, um, you know, folks talked about Gamergate as sort of the warm up of the alt right in terms of figuring out how to mobilize groups of people to, to harass and intimidate, um, you know, and to sort of play with media like it, like it was a game, you know. Um, so I think there are some big challenges there and uh, there are lots of people working on the answers, but I don't, I think it's a, it's a problem that goes beyond games. Like I said, I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to go far to see hate and toxicity online. And so I'm, I would be making lots more money if I figure, if I could figure out how to stop that, <laughs> um, you know, uh, but like some of the stuff that seems to work can be, you know, like just like more active intervention by some of the developers in terms of saying, like, here's what we, here's what we expect from our community. You know, here's what we will tolerate and what we will not. And you are not, you know, telling some folks like you are not the core, like lots of people are at the center. It's not just you, right? And you need to understand that. Um, but not every developer wants to do that. Oh, and someone asked in a private message, uh, the Duncan piece that I mentioned that critiques Huizinga. I don't have it right in front of me, but my RAs and I have a website is called classandgames.com. And if you look at our blog posts, there's one that links to the, uh, the original article that critiques uh, homo ludens. And it's also just got excellent writing by my RAs on uh, class aspects of video games, if you're curious. Great, thanks, thanks for that site. Um, we're about out of time. Actually, we've run a little bit over. Uh, me, if you have a couple extra minutes, there's one last yeah. question in the chat. Maybe we can tackle that sure. from Mark Rosenberg. Uh, by all or most definitions, tic-tac-toe is a game because it is a solved game uh, with a small game tree. More advanced game players would play the game and always end in a draw due to the simplicity of the game. Would you think that calling it not a game is an accurate description of the more advanced game players? Uh, potentially, yeah. I mean, this also reminds me of Candyland, which parents would describe more as torture than a game <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> so, you know, you can have like your big D definition and maybe little D definition, right? So like you have your personal like understandings. Um, and yeah, for like the person who understands tic-tac-toe and how it works, it's probably not a game anymore. It's just who gets to go first, you know, uh, determines who wins. Um, but yeah, like, again, I'm sort of against structural definitions, but yeah, I mean, I think for the person who knows it, you know, it's probably not a game for them, but it's just, what do you do then with that, with that rhetoric, right? Like, um, are you trying to advance agenda advance an agenda about games or not. Um, if Can I close with, with one question, Mia, that's probably not necessarily about what, what you presented on today, but mm -hmm. I think maybe connected. So, you know, the popularity of, of chess, particularly with, you know, the recent um, Netflix series yeah. and the fact everyone's stranded at home and now how has that sort of stimulated other interests in, in games and game playing that, that you've seen as a game scholar? 
I don't know with uh, the chess question. Um, it's that's been so recent and I haven't, I mean, there haven't been conferences to go to and DIGRA is delayed by a year. So we haven't even had a virtual conference. So I haven't seen any real discussion yet of like how, how that might impact, you know, like the games community. But I mentioned, you know, like the, the pandemic and there, I mean, there has been increased attention to like this legitimacy of games, whereas before, you know, they were still looked down upon. And um, I think tabletop role-playing games have become much more popular during the pandemic and you are seeing increased interest in like, um, they are seen as increasingly legitimate, like forms of adult entertainment, not just for kids. Um, and so that's something I think that's been uh, important and unique to see. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and thank you. for those of you that um, were part of this conversation, please take advantage of uh, Dr. Consalvo's uh, website and some of the work that's posted there and some of the suggestions she made in terms of reading. Um, and thanks again for joining us for another Friday morning with, uh, during the speaker series. Thank uh, you. Professor Consalvo, it's been a pleasure. We really appreciate your time and yeah. coming to us and sharing your work. Thank you, everyone. Good seeing you, Mia. Thank you. You too. <laughs> All right. And, and Thanks so way, much. We meet Thank you. you. We meet you on the